This is not the story of one man or of any one nation. It is the story of a purpose. A purpose which demands of the youth of 12 free nations that they journey forth for a space from the peaceful scenes they know and love, the better that they may learn to protect them. The tasks ahead of this one young man are the common lot of all who would preserve a peaceful way of life against aggression. The oath he swears to his country is a token of something greater still. For the country he serves has already pledged her word in the cause of cooperation with other nations. The Anglo-French Treaty, signed at Dunkirk in 1947, paved the way for the Five Power Meeting in Brussels just 12 months later. Led by Monsieur Spark for Belgium, five nations there pledged cooperation in peace and mutual aid in war. Monsieur Bido pledged the word of France, Joseph Beck, Luxembourg, Baron van Boetzler, Holland, and the later Ernest Bebb in Great Britain. Cooperation in peace. Helped by the tools of martial aid, the peoples of Western Europe toiled to rebuild their shattered culture. But in their hearts they knew that without lasting peace, reconstruction was meaningless. But peace needed its defenders. At Fontainebleau, Field Marshal Montgomery set up Western Union's military command. The roar of machines in ordnance factories made clear the fact that the nations which had pledged mutual aid were unafraid to shoulder the burdens of defense if, by so doing, they could buttress the world's will for peace. The planning of collective defense measures involved a pooling of resources, and jet aircraft were one of the main British contributions in the field of supply. From this factory at Hucklecote, Meteor jet fighters, built at a rate of one a day, have gone in large numbers to France, Belgium and Holland. Nor has the answer to aggression been forgotten. Britain's twin jet bomber, the Canberra, takes the air. High above the lands they were built to protect, the combined air fleets of Western Union have joined in battle exercises. Men of five nations flew in Operation Bulldog. Airmen from Belgium, France and the Netherlands worked side by side with Britons in furtherance of their common cause. Operation Bulldog was the first of a series of mock battles designed to weld the air and ground defense forces of Western Union into efficient and fully integrated units. None were more ready than the airborne troops of France in their understanding of what could be achieved by way of courage and unity of purpose. Super forts of the USAF, there to cooperate, brought with them the promise of an even wider roof of security. On the flat plains of Westphalia, defense maneuvers have been watched by Generals Keatley and Lat de Tassigny. What they are now seeing is the first large-scale test of coordinated battle tactics. Marshal Slim watches a live ammunition attack on a dummy troop train. The spirit of cooperation, 
has been no more evident than at sea. On the waters of Mounts Bay, off Penzance, we see warships of three Western Union nations at anchor prior to joining Belgian warships, already at sea, for combined fleet maneuvers. On board HMS Implacable, Prince Bernhardt meets Field Marshal Montgomery and admirals of the Western Union fleet. While the crew of the great aircraft carrier master for divisions, the three admirals, McGregor, Villinger and Lambert, confer over their charts. Unity of purpose animates all who serve. Fleet operations been confined to Atlantic waters alone. Admirals Mountbatten and Lambert join forces in the Mediterranean for sea air exercises. April 4, 1949, powerful hands reached across the Atlantic when seven great nations joined in concert with the five Western Union powers to safeguard the world's progress and peace. In Washington, the foreign ministers of Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Italy, Norway, Portugal, and the United States signed with the nations of Western Union the North Atlantic Pact. This was no treaty aimed at aggression but a pledge to cooperate in defense of the peace. In the heart of Paris stands the Hotel Astoria, and it is in these quiet surroundings that the military command of the new organization has been set up. To work out the pattern of close cooperation in defense, there meet the representatives not of five nations, but of 12. Collective security. A new chapter in the history of free peoples is opened as General Eisenhower signs his assumption of command over the forces of NATO in Europe. For many months, the nations of NATO have been engaged in erecting for themselves a wall of security against any possible aggression. They have no aggressive intent or purpose of their own. They intend only to see to it that they may live peaceably and secure uh, behind the arrangements that they collectively make. Today, another significant step was taken in this process of ensuring our collective security. This headquarters, formally and officially, assumed operational control and command of all forces allocated by our several countries to the defense of Europe. On the forces now at his command, the work of organization and training by Western Union has left its mark. Now, the armies of the seven other nations move forward to play their part. These are the troops of Norway. Together with the forces of Portugal and Denmark, the NATO armies in Western Europe are 1,400,000 strong. From farthest north, south to Italy, the abiding spirit is one of cooperation. This is not the story of one man's oath or of the oath of any one nation. It is the story of a purpose. A purpose which has brought men of many nations together so that united, they may be better able to preserve the way of life they know and cherish.